I have breast cancer and I have a family. I have breast cancer and I have a job. I have breast cancer and I have plans. I'm in treatment. I'm triple negative. I'm metastatic. I'm BRCA positive. I'm new to this. I have breast cancer and I needed someone to talk to. I needed information. I needed help with my bills. I needed to know what chemo would be like. I needed to know I could do this. Living Beyond Breast Cancer is a national cancer organization created by and for women with breast cancer and those who love them. We provide support and advice, organize programs and activities to raise awareness and hope. I have breast cancer and I have support. I have information. I have advice. I have breast cancer and I have hope. I have living beyond breast cancer. Hi everyone, I am Jean Sachs. I'm the CEO of Living Beyond Breast Cancer and I am so pleased to welcome both our in-person audience, um, I think 28 young women who are being trained to be our young advocates, so welcome, as well as welcoming all the viewers that are listening via live stream. Tonight's program is a topic that we could probably spend, I don't know, a month talking about and then maybe even longer, um, which is body image after a breast cancer diagnosis. And I think we all know that body image is something that didn't really start when you were diagnosed, it's something you had before and you're gonna have it again and it's not a static issue. So we're gonna hear from an amazing speaker to sort of ground us in some of those issues, give us some real tips and tools and then we're gonna hear from two amazing women who offer to share their story and open up sort of their personal, some of the you know difficult things they've dealt with and, um, and uh, you can text your questions in at any point and we'll really try to get to as many of them as possible. But before we get started, I want to thank our sponsors, because if without their support, we couldn't do what we do at Living Beyond Breast Cancer. So first, the Center for Disease Control. Living Beyond Breast Cancer has a cooperative agreement with them, which is, has been for the last seven years, really helped us develop our programs for young women impacted by breast cancer. And I also want to thank Chico's FAS, um, who have the sister brands White House Black Market, Chico's, and Soma. They have been our largest corporate sponsor for the last 15 years, uh, given us over $11 million. So they're, they're really key in helping us sustain and grow our programs. I also want to thank our board member, Dana Donafrey, who some of you in the audience have already met, and even those who are watching virtually probably already know her, but she is the founder of Anna Ono. And when she was diagnosed with breast cancer at age 27, she was not going to have the fact that there were no intimate apparel products that worked for her new body and her new reconstruction. So she started her own company and um, has been an incredible supporter. She took over our Instagram for the last week and it was so fun to hear all her stories. So I wanna just remind everyone to please stay with us. My in-person audience, you're staying no matter what, but for the people on, <laughs> we're not gonna let you out, um, that are watching virtually, there will be a special gift, but you'll have to be on listening at the end to get the information about how to redeem it. Also want to remind everyone that Living Beyond Breast Cancer has lots of programs all year long, so this is not just tonight. You can get onto our website and find out all the various things we have to offer. But one thing we have particularly for young women is we do have a closed Facebook page. Uh, we'd love everyone who's watching and listening to consider joining it. It's an amazingly supportive community. Uh, you ask a question and literally within a couple of seconds, you're going to have a lot of people answering you and providing support. So if you go onto Facebook and just search LBBC's Young Women's Initiative, you will find it and we will just ask, ask to join. You'll have to answer a couple questions and then we'll add you to the group. So to get to this incredible topic that we'll never have enough time to talk about in an hour, I'm really pleased to bring up our keynote speaker who really has done so much for Living Beyond Breast Cancer over the years. And many of you probably have seen her at other cancer conferences, Dr. Sage Bolte. She's a nationally regarded oncology social worker and an expert on sexual health and cancer. And she is the president of the Inova Health Foundation in Northern Virginia. So we're just so lucky to have her here. So Sage, welcome. Thank you. So happy to be here. 
So it's great to see faces that I recognize from all kinds of conferences um, and good to see new faces. Although I, honestly, I wish none of your faces were here and we didn't have to even talk about this dumb disease. But um, I'm glad to be here. And for those of you um, virtually joining us, we're so glad that you could come here tonight. And I never speak with cards, but I am tonight because I could talk, as Jean said, for like three hours about this. And if I, if I don't have them, I'll go off topic and we're gonna get real juicy really quick. So, um, I am looking forward to an intimate and casual conversation about body image. And why are we talking about it? One, I think it's really important um, that I name something really quick. Body image is an extremely intimate conversation and it's unique and individual to each of us. And we come into a cancer diagnosis with our own experiences and the body image challenges or successes or wins or um, gratitude for our body prior to cancer. And cancer sometimes complicates it, sometimes it enhances it, sometimes it decreases it. But for each of us, it's a unique journey. And it also, conversations like this can be triggering. And so I say that because it's not uncommon to have a conversation about um, body image and issues around intimacy, um, sexual intimacy or physical intimacy, issues about um, scars or previous traumas you had. Sometimes those can come up. So I say that because for those of you virtually joining us and for you in the audience here, if you notice that something comes up that surprises you or bothers you or churns, I would just ask that you notice it, take care of what you need to take care of. If you cry, you cry. If you laugh, you laugh. Um, but notice it in a way that is gracious and graceful to yourself and don't judge it. Um, and just take care of yourself. So when we're talking about body image, why do we talk about it? Because we can't get away from it, right? Especially here in the United States, body image is, is everywhere. It's on every billboard. It's on everything that we say see in um, ads. And specifically related to femininity or female body image, which for some of us we may identify more masculinely. What is beautiful or sexy? I know when I was going in, when I was in college, the Victoria's Secret ad of what is sexy was out, and it was you know being six two and hundred pounds. I was never going to be six two, and I definitely was not going to be hundred pounds without starving myself, right? And the messages that we receive from the media, from our friends, from our family about what is beautiful or what is sexy influences the way we also receive the changes in our body that come with a cancer diagnosis. And oftentimes what I hear, especially from women, is um, I feel guilty even feeling bad about or, or fixating on the fact that I'm worried about losing my hair or that my breast doesn't look even or that my port scar drives me nuts and I can't stop scare, staring at it. I feel bad feeling that. I feel bad because I should just be grateful that I'm alive. And um, I usually, if you've ever had a thought like that, I might really challenge it if you came to see me for counseling. Because the reality is any feeling or thought you have is valid and important. And cancer sucks. And it rocks our world and it changes things. And it changed things that you didn't have control over, like the shape of your breasts if you had to have a lumpectomy or a mastectomy, like the scar that you get from your port that for many people is forever visible and constant uh, reminder of a cancer diagnosis. And it, it's also okay to grieve. So one of the things we don't do a very good job about or, or with is um, both normalizing that um, body image issues can come up and that it's okay, that it's okay to be angry that your hair is different. It's okay to be angry that your body looks different or feels different. And it's okay to celebrate the differences because you might embrace and like some of those differences. But we also have to give permission to grieve the losses and be hopeful. Sometimes I think we say we have to grieve and then we stay in that sadness and that loss and we don't. We can grieve and be hopeful. We can grieve the loss of a breast and be really happy with our flat chest, right? Both can be true. And both are important to be true as we transition into loving and accepting our bodies for what they are. Body image is a part of your self-esteem, right? The way we think about ourselves often influences the way we feel about ourselves, which then influences our behaviors. So if I wake up in the morning and the first thing out of my mind is, oh my God, you look like that again, right? 
that message is not usually loving and kind and gracious. It's going to be self-critical. And typically, the feeling that's going to be attached with that thought is uh, anxiety, worry, shame, embarrassment, right? And then the behavior that might follow may be a negative one. Maybe I um, hide more from my friends. Maybe I isolate myself. Maybe I um, put on something that doesn't make me feel any better because I'm, you know, I feel frumpy, so I might as well dress frumpy, right? That those behaviors then amplify my negative body image, where if I wake up in the morning and I notice that thought and I catch it and I say, you know what, Sage, you're doing everything you can today to help your body heal. Very different message that sends then the feeling of hope and good and calm that then my behaviors might follow of, okay, I don't feel as good today. I don't feel like I look like I'm rocking it as much as I did yesterday. So maybe I'm going to pull out my favorite lipstick or I'm going to rock a new hair, hairdo today or I'm going to put on an outfit that I feel really confident in. The one thing about body image is we actually have some control and choice over how we respond to it. Some of the common challenges that come up related to body image would be you know, weight gain, weight loss, scars. Um, with weight gain and weight, weight loss often come stretch marks. Um, changes in skin sensation, that if you have a scar that is highly sensitive that actually you can't kind of stop thinking about, that can make you very, very aware of your body. Um, when your, your hair changes, maybe it's thinning, maybe it's a different color or a different texture than it was. Again, for some people, that is not a big deal. It just slides on by. And for others, it's what they see every time they go in the mirror that, that brings them to their knees. And again, for some people, they may say, it's just hair, right? It grows back. And I want to really normalize that it's okay to be angry about that and sad about that. And it's also okay for it to just be hair. Both can be okay, and both of those responses are okay because we as individuals each come with our own stories and our own values. So if we know that body image not only comes with its own challenges, the way we think about ourselves, the way we feel about ourselves, the way we behave, it also can influence relationships, positively and negatively. Right? If we feel shy or stuck in our body, if we don't feel confident in our body, and we are engaging in relationships with people, sexual or not, if I'm more self-conscious and my body is being held more like this, the message I send is that I'm more withdrawn. Don't talk to me. Don't approach me. Right? Where if I'm up more confidently, and, and maybe I have no hair, and maybe I have no breasts, but I, uh, I'm presenting myself as I own this room, I'm much more approachable. Body image has an impact because the way we think and feel about ourselves has an impact on our relationships. So what do we do about this? We're going to talk about it in a conversation um, shortly with our guests. But first and foremost, as I said before, the first step of kind of reclaiming our body image is acknowledging the losses and allowing there to be grief, and then really looking at how do I want to redefine what I see? What do I want to be true, and how can I make that happen? You can't you know, remove a port scar necessarily, but you might be able to do things to minimize it. Um, maybe you are comfortable being flat, but once in a while you like wearing prosthetics because it reminds you of your connection to your breasts, and maybe not. Give yourself room to grieve and be creative with, with how you can um, treat your body. The other thing I love telling people is pull out a piece of paper and write 10 things that you love about yourself. And we'll talk about this a little later, but 10 things that you really like and or love about yourself that really have nothing to do with your physical beauty. What accomplishments have you had? What are the things that you've achieved that you're really proud of? What, what, are the, what are your values? Are you a kind person? Are you a caring person? What would your friends say about you? Because oftentimes, when we get fixated on the body image piece, we're so fixated on a visible piece, we forget about all the things that make us who we are, which is some of that is physical, but the majority of it, even in our relationships, right? We might be initially attracted to someone, but after that, they could be really hot and you find out they're a total ass, you're no longer attracted to them in the same way. So remember that our character, the who we are, the qualities of who we are is just as important. Second, watch what you're putting in your head. Right? Become aware of the thoughts that come up in your head that are self-critical, are self-doubting, are self-judging, because we actually have more control over that than we give ourselves credit for often. If those thoughts are coming up more regularly, catch them. It doesn't mean we can prevent them, 
at all. Oftentimes thoughts are automatic. But if we catch them, we can do something with them. I can challenge them, I can reframe them. If I notice that the thought is, um, I can't believe you look like that again today, I can challenge and say, I'm gonna put on the thing that makes me feel really strong and confident. I'm gonna choose to put on the lipstick that makes me feel sassy, right? I'm gonna call my best friend and have her tell me all the things that are great about me because I just need to hear that. I can choose a different behavior. We also have our control over things that we do. Like, it's not vain to go and talk to a, a, a cosmetic surgeon. If something is really bothering you and you can't get your mind off of it, it's okay to have a conversation with a cosmetic surgeon to see if there's something that can be done to fix it. It's okay to see a cosmetologist, an esthetician, um, a makeup artist, somebody that helps you embrace or enhance other things. You know, oftentimes cancer takes a lot of things, but it, it doesn't often take the sparkle out of your eye or it doesn't change your smile often. And especially breast cancer, when I see women, when they are out and they are feeling strong, and whether they are bald, have a full head of hair, breast, no breast, and they are smiling, their eyes light up in the same way they did before they had cancer, and sometimes even more because of what they're feeling um, and invigorated in in life. The other thing when we catch our thoughts is ask yourself, would you say this to another person? I'm amazed sometimes at the negative messages I give to myself that there is no way on this planet I would ever say to another human. Right, if I look in the mirror and I say, um, if, my, if my fat voice comes out, right, and all of you would look at me and be like, you, you're, you don't think that. I, absolutely, because I'm a human, right? And no matter how small I am or strong I am, I'm gonna have those questions. And I have that fat girl voice from elementary school. And when I hear that, I hear things that are not positive or loving or kind at all. And none of those thoughts are things I would actually say to another human, so why would I continue to say them to myself? And so catching those thoughts and offering yourself something that is more kind or positive is important. Identify a thought, then counter the behavior, right? I feel this, I'm gonna do something different to counter it. If I'm feeling low today, I'm gonna to make sure I take extra care of myself today. I'm gonna to put on the lotion that makes me feel calm. I'm gonna go get a massage. I'm gonna go with someone that makes me feel good and beautiful. That's important. Number three, become aware. Sometimes it's just a matter of becoming more aware of what it is we are feeling. Sometimes we can go through a cancer diagnosis and literally be numb the whole way through until the end where we look back and think, oh my God, what just happened? So as we become more aware, as we become more aware of what we feel, as we become more aware of, of our bodily settling, in, our body settling in, and that might be, you know, today I might feel different than I do a year from now, and that's all okay too. Ways that you can help become more aware is through counseling, see a therapist, start talking about some of these things. Use your spiritual practices, pray, meditate, sit, be with spirit, and ask for some awareness, some grace. Journal is a great way to um, really challenge and work on um, body image, and, and neg specifically negative body image. Talk about the things that are great in your life instead of focusing on the things that are hard. Creative expression like movement, we actually know exercise and diet are tremendous things that help with body image. The more you move, the stronger you feel, the healthier you feel, the more the food that you put in your body feels nutritious and good, the better you feel about your body. They're linked hand in hand. It has nothing to do with weight. It has everything to do with movement and nutrition. Things like mindful eating, if we're noticing that our weight is fluctuating and now I'm in menopause and it's that much harder to lose weight. Mindful eating is a really wonderful skill that not only helps you feel more in control of what you're putting in, but it also helps your body image because you're more self-aware. Instead of mindless eating where we're just eating and grabbing and going, mindful eating can be really wonderful for your body and spirit. Use positive words. If you notice the can'ts or the shouldn'ts, start challenging those. The, the amount of time I hear like I should have been or I shouldn't be, right? I should be grateful that I'm alive. I can't do that because I would challenge that. Is that realistic? And sometimes it's rational and realistic, but a lot of times it's not. What can you do? What should you be doing and can you be doing? Use present tense. So instead of I used to be, I am, right? I am healthy right now or I am as healthy as I can be right now. I am strong, 
I am hopeful. Use positive language that reinforces my eyes sparkle, I am beautiful. Look in the mirror when you say these things because that has power. There's actually power when we look in the mirror and make eye contact with ourselves. It actually registers to our brain in a different way. So lock in, look and tell yourself something, self something positive. Set a timer for five minutes, and I tried this and I will tell you it was really hard. The, my therapist once said, set a timer for 10 minutes and write things that you really like about yourself or that you feel accomplished in, and I could like barely get through 30 seconds. It's like, oh my God, 30 seconds is really long. So five minutes is my challenge to you, and it's gonna feel like forever. Um, but writing things that you really like about yourself that again, are the accomplishments kind of like that list of 10. What are the things that people might say about you that, you, that are, are good about you? Um, hug yourself. As silly as that seems, hugs are really powerful. Touch is really powerful. And when we're beating our body up through our negative talk, through our talk about our body of what isn't and what can't be, when we can just love and hug ourselves, it can have a really positive um, effect. Smiling at ourselves, smile in the mirror. Smiling has a huge impact as well. I'm sure you've all heard it takes more muscles to frown than it does to smile, right? That smiling is easy. It's a good thing and it's good for us. Being kind and gracious with yourself, and I don't say that to minimize or make it seem like it's so easy, but we need to be a little bit more kind to ourselves. Extend the kind of grace and kindness you would extend to others, to yourself. And again, take a moment to grieve and a moment to be hopeful. There's um, an exercise that I really like to do and I'm gonna make you all do it with me here. And for those of you watching out there, I'm gonna ask you to stand up from wherever you are. If you're driving, don't do that. Um, but there is a stance I like to take that when, um, when we're feeling down on ourselves, when we're feeling weaker, less than, um, there's something powerful in this stance. So if you're capable and able, I want you to stand up. I want you to get in the super woman or man or human or power or whatever it is stance. So feet apart, hands on your hips, chest out. And I want you to notice as you broaden your arms out, right, your, your shoulders back and you look forward and you smile, how that changes what you feel. And I want you with me to say, I am strong. I am strong. I am a badass. I am a badass. I am beautiful. I am beautiful. I am good. I am good. Yeah, good. You all are badasses. You are beautiful. You are good. And doing this for 30 seconds can change what happens up here. Standing in the stance of strength can change the way we feel in our body, can change the way we respond and interact with our body. So I challenge you to do this once a day, twice a day, three times a day when you're getting ready to go in for an interview or on a date and you're nervous, get in your stance. <laughs> it's amazing what can happen. So thank you for your time. I'm looking forward to extending more conversation yeah. now. Well, thank you, Sage. That was great. And it's always important to remember how powerful your brain is. Yeah. I think we forget that. You know, we think we don't have control, but we really do. So remember, everyone in, in our audience, that anytime you have a question, you can start texting it in, 610-365-7532. We will be getting to them soon. But I want to bring our two um, amazing women who both have been diagnosed with breast cancer way too young um, and have offered to come and talk a little bit about how body image has impacted their life. So I know Sage really talked a lot about sort of giving yourself the space to grieve. And so I want to just start with N Nadia. 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 Yes. Um, if you could tell us a little bit about how you did that. Um, after a while of just going through just different things, I was able to grieve my breast cancer now. I think time heals. I think the um, positive energy. And a lot of it's each is just talking to yourself and speaking those positive things over yourself. You will see that you are stronger than cancer, and you can come through it. You can get through whatever you're going through. Okay. So that helped me grieve and just do away with the other thoughts, the negative thoughts. That's great. And I know, Shannon, you're closer to your diagnosis. Um, so do you want to tell us what it's been like for you? 
Uh, as far as grieving goes? Yeah, sort of giving yourself the space. Um, I don't know, I never really grieved it, because as you, as you all know, when you're going through it, you're numb. Yeah. You don't really pay attention. I, I never cried, I never thought about it, you know, because you're being treated. You're there, mm -hmm. you're in it. It was when it was over that I looked back and I was like, like you said, what just happened? Um, and I think that's when I started kind of grieving it and I started pouring myself in, into other things. Right. Um, just happy to be alive. Yeah. yeah, that's good. So I want to talk a little bit more about your diagnosis. I know you were diagnosed with inflammatory breast cancer, which yes. is relatively rare and brings up a lot of you know, other issues. Um, but since this program is really focused on body image, yes. we want to sort of reflect back on what was your body image before you were diagnosed? Okay, so I'm heavier as you all can see. So for me, I always had a, a, just a little bit of insecurities about my weight, um, but I've always been beautiful. <laughs> so that has helped me. <laughs> People often come up to me and let me know how beautiful I am. So that really helped me with the weight issues. But then after cancer, it was the, the scars. Um, for me, it was, um, I have like a small indentation here um, mm -hmm. that really was the trouble area for me because you can see it a lot. Um, I had a muscle removed and put there so you can kind of see it moving. And um, sorry, I got sidetracked. So you can see it moving. So for me, it was just a lot of those things and just seeing those things, like I said, looking in the mirror and looking at and things like that. So I really just, yeah. Yeah. It was just really a lot just to, to deal with, take it over. I had reconstruction surgery mm -hmm. to kind of get that filled in. Um, and the tissue died, so I'm still stuck with it. So for me, I am very comfortable with having this dent here, and I don't want to get it filled anymore. Uh -huh. um, it's kind of a conversation starter for me. <laughs> and so I like to tell people about it, because like you said, I had a rare breast cancer, so I like to bring that up. I like to tell people about that. People need to know that I didn't really have a lump or things like that. It was different for me. Yeah, it's very yeah. different. And I did not even notice your dent, as you call <laughs> it, until you brought attention no. to it. So Sorry, it is, no. <laughs> it's amazing what we think everybody sees. Yes. And, you know, they really don't. I know you talked a lot about you expected that you would lose weight when you started going yes. through treatment, but were actually surprised when you felt like you gained weight. So Yes. For me, when you first hear about cancer, you know, normally the movie shows a lot of people losing weight, you know, losing your hair, things like that. So I thought those things were going to happen to me, um, but they didn't. I gained 30 pounds, and so I wasn't happy about it because I had lost 70 pounds before I found out about cancer. So it was really hard for me. It was really hard to gain the weight, um, but I'm dealing with it now. I'm just really, like Shannon said, grateful to be here. I don't want to complain about anything. Right. Well, you yeah. look great. Thank so. you. <laughs> But I know, Shannon, for you, weight was an issue as well. Um, yes. Do you want to tell us a little bit about it's that? Definitely more so now. Um, so I got married about five years ago. And, um, you know, when you get married, you're losing weight so you can look good in your dress. Um, and, you know, we got married, and then two years later, I was diagnosed. Um, and, you know, I gained a lot of weight. And, some of it might have been the snacks that people dropped off at our house. <laughs> um, it wasn't all from cancer, but you know, now that I'm on medicine that you know, makes me gain weight, it's, I, I love myself for who I am when I'm not looking at myself. But when you see yourself in the mirror every day, that's when you, you go, man, you know, this, this is not who I am, you know? And then that's when you start talking negative to yourself. So, Sage, can you talk about that? Because I think weight is such yeah, a big so issue huge. for women. So I think, you know, one, thank you both for being so courageous to share. Um, it takes a lot of courage. And, you know, I think it would be, one, setting realistic goals. What, what are the goals that you have and are they realistic? The reality is that when we're putting you on hormone therapies, mm -hmm. it's a lot harder to lose weight um, with suppressing those hormones that help us, right? They, um, it's a lot harder. Um, and a lot of women call it like their menopausal pooch. They feel like things just get heavier there. So um, a couple of things. One, talk to um, your doctors, obviously, but 
talking to a dietitian and talking to a, um, someone who is certified in personal training for oncology survivors, mm -hmm. so they're oncology certified, okay. they really actually have better understanding of how you build muscle, how you work around if you've had a mastectomy mm -hmm. um, to not aggravate things, but they may have some tips and, and tricks up their sleeve that yeah. others don't. We do know that you're gonna have to work 20 minutes harder every day than your peers. Um, and so that's just a reality that you're gonna have to do 20 more cardiovascular minutes than you used to do. Um, and so I think finding creative ways to break that up because nobody has another 20 minutes in their day. So it's, it's finding, finding time exactly. for that. Mm -hmm. And that's because of the menopause, right? That's right, right. Yeah. So that's right. Those... and the medications that we're on continue to keep you yes. there. Right, which is not fair. Yeah. No. You're way too young to have to you know, add that extra 20 minutes. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. And again, you know, if, if the weight, the weight isn't gonna go off like it used to, and so also just being gracious with yourself and finding things that you can feel pretty and sexy in that, that again, maybe there's a stylist, like at Nordstrom's, you can see a stylist who helps match clothes that maybe um, enhance or hide parts of your body that you feel more comfortable with and working with a stylist to help you find things that that enhance that could be an idea. Yeah, so I wanna just bring up breast reconstruction because I know that's another really big issue when it comes to body image. And I know for you, because you had inflammatory breast cancer, there was a question, would you be able to have breast reconstruction or not? So tell us a little bit about when you were in that in-between phase and then when you were able to have the reconstruction, how that, you know, okay. your, maybe your thoughts about body image shifted. Okay, um, so at first um, they were talking about giving me implants, but the type of cancer that I had um, wasn't allowed for me to get implants, so they didn't give me any expanders or anything. So in the beginning it was very, very hard, like I said, because I had to just do different stuff in, and I was heavier, so um, I had um, like a, a cotton, like yarn cotton type breast thing, I don't know what it's called, but I had that and I used that, but it was smaller, so I had to steal stuff. So, <clears throat> so you were Sorry. stuffing your yes, bra? Yes, okay. which is different stuff on top of it. <laughs> yes, I know. Sounds funny, but... And no, I don't think you're alone in that, right? People get creative you're things. Not, yeah. I have socks, cotton yeah. balls. I mean, yes, like all of people get stuff. creative with stuff. Yes. Yeah, so I had to use a lot of different stuff. So, of course, it, it becomes agitating when you're taking pictures and stuff, singing out. And so I really was in a space where I thought I wouldn't get the reconstruction because it took about maybe almost two years to get it. And so my doctors were, like, on the fence about giving me it and just, you know, trying to tell me I really didn't need it, but if I really wanted to get it, I could. So for me, it was it was sadness and just waiting for that time period. But when I was able to get it, um, it changed a lot better for me. I feel a lot better in my, in my bras. I'm able to wear no bra and it doesn't look like <laughs> lopsided or anything like that. So for me, that was the easiest part, just getting to the end of that. But in the beginning, it was very hard. Yeah, and just it's a thinking, long road. Just waiting yeah. and thinking that you're not gonna get it. Right. Mm -hmm. I know it's a big issue, so we'll probably yeah. come back to that and people may have questions. But Shannon, just to bring you back in one more time, um, I know that you had mentioned you had been recently married when you were diagnosed, and mm -hmm. I think you said you feel like you're a completely different woman than what your husband, or, or in your mind, mm -hmm. what you thought your husband, the woman you thought your husband yeah. was sure marrying. I'm say different, because he'd probably get in trouble if he, if he admitted <laughs> but it. But he may actually that. believe it. <laughs> actually being honest. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 he is, he is, he's a good guy. Um, yeah, I mean, I, if you look at pictures of me, you know, on our wedding day compared to the person I am now, um, I just, I kind of feel like he got cheated a little bit, you know, he's had this one thing and got this other thing, so. Yeah, that's really hard. Yeah. And I, I want to bring you in to talk about that because I think that often we are our hardest critics. Oh, yeah. And, you know, the people that love us, whether it's your partner, your husband, your friends around you don't don't see you in the same way. So, so and I think, again, I appreciate your vulnerability because um, I know this brings up that. And, and it's something I hear from a lot of women. I feel like, you know, she or he got the raw end of this deal and I'm not who I was. But when we look at who you are, if we remove the physical changes that happened, I'm guessing you were the exact same person that he oh, married. Yeah. And, and that's typically who we marry, right? The person yeah. inside. Yeah. Um, I don't want to minimize the fact, though, that feeling good about yourself is really important yeah, too. Yeah. So, um, you know, even the uh, um, the conversation with yourself around who are you and who are you in this relationship and what do you bring and yeah. what are the other parts of you that are still really rocking yeah. and um, how do you enhance those parts so that it still feels like you have 
some pride in in um, in your body and in your yeah. relationship with him. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And I don't think. I mean, you're not alone in people feeling right. like you look in the mirror, you see one thing, but That's other right. people say other things. I mean, I think it's great that you said you always. People said you were beautiful, and you held, you hold on to that. It really helps if someone is telling you that. Yeah. Is that kind of what you know? What you? Yeah, I think getting affirmed and having people tell you that. I, I think the reality is people can tell you that a hundred times, and if you don't believe it yourself, it's just words, right? Part. So, yeah. so the hardest part is where we start convincing exactly. ourselves and changing exactly. our own script, our own story, yeah. and that comes from our own self-talk and and some of the changes that we can make internally. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to breast reconstruction, because I do think this is one of those areas where we have evolved, right? I mean, it used to be, you know, every woman had a radical mastectomy, no choice, and whether you had reconstruction or not. And we've, we have evolved to the point where there's more choices. They're not all perfect. Often it takes a while to make it. But a lot of women are choosing to go flat. They're also choosing to tattoo you know, put Tattoo? beautiful tattoos on their chest or on their reconstructed breasts, so, and really claiming it. So are you, are you seeing that as a positive thing? And Yeah, and I mean, I think any time you have choice and say over your body and what your body looks like, there is power and good to that, right? So um, there are more and more women who uh, are going flat and feel comfortable and confident in being flat, and even women who go flat but still once in a while wear prosthetics. Um, and there are other women who can't imagine being flat, and that's okay, right? They're both okay because what is most important is what is right for you. I think the other piece is to remember that almost nothing is permanent. So some people may make a choice and then decide this isn't actually right for me, and they may need to have a different conversation with their doctor down the road. Um, that there are almost always, almost, not always, but almost always options um, and ways to change the decision or make a different decision. I've known women who have had reconstruction, weren't happy with it, and decided to go flat. Um, right. So I think, again, it is awesome that we have choice, and the more control we have over that choice that comes from you, not mm -hmm. someone else, um, whether that's a partner, a family member, or a physician, uh, th the more powerful and comfortable we feel because it's our choice. Right. I mean, we also often hear with young women that you know your doctor will say, well, of course you're going to have reconstruction. You're young. Like, and, and that sometimes the patient, the woman, has to really fight back and say, I, it's not what you think, it's what I think. Mm -hmm. And that is a really, that can be a hard thing. So I don't know if, you know, that kind of sort of assumption, of course you want to do this. And sure. Or of course, of course you want to have areolas tattooed, and of course you want a nipple, and of course, right, where, I mean, not everybody likes nipping out all the time. Some people are happy to not. So. <laughs> They're um, <laughs> but, but having the conversation and feeling free in the choice and being able to um, feel confident is really important. Yeah. Well, I want to bring in our audience at both live and virtual to see if there are questions. Although, well, you're all live, but <laughs> some of you are in the room. And I want to remind everyone to, you know, there is a lot of discussion on these close, on our closed Facebook page about breast reconstruction. So again, think about joining our Facebook page. Um, and, and be a part of that dialogue. But I want to bring in um, Lynn Falkman, who is a Living Beyond Breast Cancer employee, but she's also a breast cancer survivor herself and was diagnosed young. And uh, you might want to say a few words before you yes, bring yes. in some there, questions. Yes, yes, there were some great points made. Um, I love when Nadia said in <coughs> regards to your, your dent that you call yes. it, it's now a car conversation starter. Yes. So sort of like flipping um, that mm -hmm. around. Um, I, I think as well, Shannon, you know, when going through treatment, right, you are just, what's next? What's in front of me? What's right in front of me? And you don't really have that time to take it in. And suddenly, you are out of treatment. Um, and you start to think about what happened. and. Um, to heal and to grieve. I, I don't think, I think you're moving so fast at that point in time where you don't have time for that. Mm -hmm. um, we do have questions I'm coming sure. in. So, <laughs> um, when and how do you tell a date about your foobs? Mm -hmm. The foobs. <laughs> so, um, I will give my opinion, and you guys can give your opinion as well. Um, honestly, when we're talking about disclosure at all, um, how many of you on a first date talk about your crazy mother, right? Or um, all the crazy things you did in, in high school or college. It's not 
common that we do that on the first date. It's getting to know you. And so I, I, I kind of have a rule of thumb for people. Some people, the fact is that you've put it all over social media. You have a bumper sticker. Your license plate says foobs. Like there's no way to hide the fact that you're a survivor or that there's something different about your body maybe. Um, so if it's out there, they probably already know. Um, if it's not, um, I would say, you know, give it a few dates. Feel the person out because that guy or girl may not be somebody worth having that emotional conversation or talking to them about or bringing up that information because if they can't sit with you in that space, you don't want to share that. Um, so I typically say by date five, usually dates one through four, kind of getting to know you. Um, unless you're like a, let's take our clothes off on the first date, then you probably want to <laughs> disclose before then. <laughs> that would be my only recommendation. Uh -huh. Like before the clothes come before off. Before the clothes come off. There's something I should tell you. Yes. Do either of you want to add anything? I know you were, you were married, but. Uh, exactly what she said. Yeah, they I don't need to know it. until, yeah. unless I'm considering yes. taking my clothes off or yes. Yeah. 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 That's my opinion. I agree with that yeah. as well. I don't think there's any perfect answer, right? Yeah. Yeah. No. And, I, and again, I think you need to, you need to trust your intuition on w when is the right time. And uh, typically, again, before it gets physical is the right time. Because um, it can be a little awkward when a hand starts going on your shirt. You're like, wait a minute, let me tell you something. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> Do you have another question? I then? do. And this sort of leads into along the theme that we're going. Um, so someone's really saying like they're feeling ashamed of maybe not having nipples, um, especially when it came to intimacy, and felt like they had to warn them before they took their bra mm -hmm. off. So can you speak to that? Yeah, and I actually realized when you said when and how, I said the when, but I didn't say the how. So this speaks to that a little bit, too. The, the how part, um, again, personal and how you talk and communicate is certainly going to be your own organic way. And so how I might talk and communicate may be different. But um, when you're disclosing your cancer history, typically there's going to be questions. Because now nowadays, there's a lot of cancer survivors out there. And there's so much education that it's not uncommon for people to know somebody who's had a cancer diagnosis. So they're going to probably ask questions like, oh, so did you have your breasts removed? Did you get a new one? Are they, did they up, somebody actually asked this on a date. So did you upgrade? <laughs> Um, the, the, you're going to get asked, so I think being able to be comfortable and confident in your own story is key number one. How are you going to answer those questions? Um, are you going to disclose that you had a bilateral mastectomy with reconstruction or that you chose to go flat or that you use prosthetics um, for uh, the visual? Right. Know what's comfortable for you, but then um, talking about what it means that you don't have any nipple sensation so they can play all they want there and that it's not going to do anything for you. <laughs> um, that, um, but that it doesn't mean that it can't be touched, right? You are going to have to be the one that directs and educates um, and talks to them about what does and doesn't feel good, what um, it looks like. Um, and that may be showing them. It may be just talking about it before they see it. When you're talking about an areola or a nipple, if you've had reconstruction without an areola or a nipple, I think it's just a matter of disclosing that. So I had reconstruction. I chose not to get nipple or areola done because uh, I didn't want to whatever, whatever your answer is, and let that be. Um, and again, if you're at a place where you feel like they're safe enough to disclose that to, most of the people I have talked to when a disclosure like that has happened, it's kind of like, okay, I'm like I'll roll with it. Um, and it's not as big of a deal as we may anticipate it being. But it is a lot, right? It's a lot. I mean, yeah. you're already, you've already been diagnosed young, yeah. which is already, yeah. you know, your body betrayed you. I mean, so many feelings. Yeah. Why? Just really difficult. Yeah. And then this adds this next layer of you have to have this really open conversation. Right. And I think there are some people who are really comfortable, but I know for some people, even saying areola or I don't have nipples very and, uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. Is, yeah. is so hard. And how much experience yeah. did they have even prior to be di yeah. being diagnosed? So I think everybody has to sort of figure out what, what, what are they comfortable with? with and well, and I think that goes back, Jean, to you have to know your own story and get comfortable mm -hmm. with your own story because if you can't sit down, and I'll tell people, you know, practice with your best friend. Practice disclosure <laughs> with your best friend. Get comfortable with your language. If you need to show your boob or your no boob uh -huh. to your best friend so that you can get comfortable, even that just practicing allows you to get comfortable with the language because when you're sitting across from someone on a date, if you're anxious and nervous, 
they're gonna be anxious and nervous. But if you're confident, like it's a conversation starter, <laughs> right. um, that person across from you is gonna have a very different reaction. Great, okay, I know Lynn has got more yes. questions. So this really relates to, um, again, someone who's living with metastatic breast cancer mm -hmm. and how they really talk to a date about that. Yeah. So this is hard. This is hard. Um, the reality is disclosing at a young age that you have cancer is hard anyways. Um, and uh, not something that many people your age have had to deal with. And so the relatability of it is hard already for the person that you're on the date with. With metastatic disease, it's hard. Um, because you have to disclose not only did you have it, but you're going to have it for life. And what we know about that life expectancy is different for everyone, right? And I don't, I don't know who asked the question, so you know your own story. Um, but being able to talk about that of um, when they say, well, what does this mean? It means I'm going to be on treatment for life. What does that mean? It means that I'm closely watched by my doctors, that I may change chemotherapy every three months, every year, every six years. We don't really know. But I know that I have a care team that really is taking incredible care of me. I know I'm really hopeful. I know I feel really strong. Right? You can also focus on what is true, not just all the scary things that come with it. Um, and and then the honesty around what it means for your life when they ask, because they will ask um, about, does this mean you'll die from this? You have to be, again, prepared and comfortable with your own story, whatever that looks like. Um, because the reality is some of you may confidently say, I don't know. I'm hoping there's a cure next week, right? And we don't know. So just like, um, I, I hate using this because it's so cliche, you know, we never know if we're going to get on the on 495, especially where I live in DC, and you know, get taken out. We don't always know um, when that might happen. And, and reframing that question back to them of, you know, how are you going to live your fullest, best life? This just this just reminds me I'm going to live my fullest and best life right now, and I'd love to be in a relationship with you in that. Right? If you get to a point where you're disclosing, um, it is hard. Again, everybody needs to find their story, and when living with metastatic disease, you got to find what works for you, but again, that confidence and competence around who I am and what I bring, because cancer's, cancer's a part of your story, it is not your story, right? You are so much more than your cancer, and that is true when you're living with metastatic disease, too. Yeah, that's good. So I think, Dana, we can bring you into the conversation, because certainly you, you, you have things to share, so maybe tell us a little bit about how you struggled with this, how you redefined yourself, and... Um, some lessons. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much. Uh, I'm honored to be here as a board member of Living Beyond Breast Cancer, but as a young patient and survivor myself, uh, diagnosed at the age of 27 in 2010. Um, I think that uh, my love and hope goes out to everybody here streaming and on stage telling their story because in 2010, I was completely, absolutely 100% alone um, in navigating these waters and traversing what uh, you know, marriage looked like for me, what my fiance thought about my body, what I thought about my own body, how I literally was taking mirrors down out of my house because um, I could not look at myself in the mirror and um, not having anywhere to turn. Nobody was on the internet. Nobody was flashing their foobs on Instagram. Um, I had no idea what, I, what surgery I was going to go into, what it was going to look like, and, um, and finding the road of my own beauty and my own strength um, literally by myself was uh, a challenge. And I think that, uh, you know, when I, my doctor told me I could tattoo on uh, my nipples, I thought, well, if you could tattoo nipples, can you tattoo anything? And I decided to get a mastectomy tattoo when, uh, again, there was no pictures on the internet or anywhere for me to turn or a tattoo artist to find. So I was... Um, alone in, in that journey and my plastic surgeon's jaw like hit the floor uh, when I came in and I, I did my first exam and he asked me pretty much what the F did you just do? And uh, I thought it was cool. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and also like sexuality and intimacy. I mean, I, I couldn't look at myself in the mirror. So how was I going to show somebody else my body, uh, somebody that loved me and I loved them back? And uh, a big part of that was why I launched Ana Ono, because I figured if I couldn't take off my clothes um, and I was wearing a sports bra underneath, that it should be a pretty sports bra. And, uh, and so I took my fashion design experience and I applied that to my own real life, not knowing that me talking about uh, 
my sex life with my fiance and husband was now going to be my platform everywhere I went. So the poor guy is like, do you have to keep talking about our sex life? And I said, actually I do, because nobody is. And, um, and anyways, I just uh, am very honored to be here and to uh, hear these stories because every single thing that Sage has said and Shannon and Nadia has said is, is something that has spun around in my head for the last nine and a half years uh, surviving this disease. So uh, knowing that it's, it's kind of always present, it's always there, but you find uh, ways to work through it. So thank so you. Gina, and before you, you, you pass it back to Lynn, because I'm sure she has more questions, I did notice in the video that we showed in the beginning that you're in it. I don't know if anyone <laughs> recognized her, but yeah. I really do feel like you've transformed your hairstyle, your the way you do you want to talk a little bit about how you sort of over time really decided to make some changes? Yeah, I think um, you learn to love yourself in different ways. And uh, they're not always good and they're not always healthy. And I'm going to say that because I think it's a very real, honest mm -hmm. moment that uh, you might think you're loving yourself in the best way possible, but you can look back on it two or three years down the road and say that wasn't healthy. Um, I think, Sage, you said something about eating, <laughs> mindful eating, and not, uh, you know, there was a point in time I said, screw it. I'm going to eat, drink, do whatever I want to do because I had cancer and what's the worst that's going to happen to me. Um, and that f affects you physically. Uh, you can gain weight, you can lose weight. I've chopped my hair off 15 different ways to Tuesday, <laughs> mostly because of the hot flashes. <laughs> it just kept getting shorter and shorter and shorter. Now I'm sticking with it because it keeps me cool uh, during the day. And you know, all, all of that from even dressing yourself. I mean, a, again, a huge reason why I launched the line was because I couldn't dress myself. So I woke up feeling frumpy, dressing like I was frumpy, living my life like I was frumpy. And that was never who I was before cancer. And that took me years to rediscover who I was going to be moving forward. And um, I learned to stop reaching backwards because I wanted the same hairdo before chemo. I wanted the same body before cancer affected it. I wanted all these things that I used to have that cancer took away from me. And then I realized I actually couldn't achieve those things again. So I have to find a new thing, like my new hairdo, my new body, my new outfit. Um, I have a closet full of moo's, and I think they're great. <laughs> I appreciate that, and I know Lynn, Lynn probably has other questions, so you can pass the mic back, but I just want to say that I think for a lot of women, their hair sort of becomes their identity, yeah. and cancer really pushes you, you know, and, and, and it doesn't grow back the same, so I think it's great. Like, you look beautiful, you have always been beautiful, and you've just embraced this new way of putting yourself in the world. What else do you have for us, Lynn? All right. <laughs> um, so... Uh, a lot of the solutions for body image relate to finding ways, as you spoke, to sort of get creative and feel good about the, yourself. But they sort of se maybe seem impractical for mm -hmm. people who are maybe in debt, um, for treatment. Um, are there ideas of things that are affordable or things that people can do or, or other ways in which they can go about doing that? Yeah, I mean, the, you know, again, the, the most important thing is our brain and our thoughts, which hopefully is not affected by debt. So I think focusing on that. The other, the, the reality of cosmetic or, or changes or talking to a, um, a beautician, certainly that might be impractical, although look good, feel better is an option through the American Cancer Society and a lot of places that can teach you um, makeup techniques and style techniques. Um, taking a friend with you and having your friend play dress up on you, going to um, TJ Maxx or a store that's very affordable or going into your closet and having your friend you know, go through your closet and pull new things out and try new things on. Sometimes just letting someone else do it with or for you and walking alongside of you in it can free you up because we get stuck so much in our head and in our old ways of what, what it used to be, what it could be. And when we let someone come in with, a, with creative thought or new energy or um, enthusiasm to help, um, you certainly uh, can, can get new ideas. I mean, there are beauty schools and cosmetic, cosmetology schools and fashion schools that you can also use that their students are always looking for someone to do something fun to. So um, that's another, another option. Yeah, and I think that, um, and, and that's a really important issue and I'm glad you asked that yeah. question because the financial toxicity of cancer is huge and often lasts a much longer than your treatment. 
Um, but there are also a lot of resources. Live Strong has Y programs. Yeah. I mean, call Living Beyond Breast Cancer. We can help you find resources. There's retreats. Yeah. I mean, I, I know some people who every other month they're going somewhere. Yeah. So I, you have to get on that internet and really search and find, but more and more that they're really trying to make that available. And there are some things too that happen like the skin changes you have and some of the rosacea that can develop that actually would be covered by a physician to be seen by again as a result. So if you have insurance, there actually may be ways to get consultations with dermatologists um, or plastic surgeons that would be covered by your insurance. So it's also important to think again, it's not just going to a plastic surgeon for fun because I want something new, but it actually may be covered by your insurance based yeah, on. Yeah, that's a good point. All right, we're gonna do one more question. Okay, one more question. Um, a lot of the issues, again, that we've talked about with body image really relate to that grief that you talked about. Um, I know you touched on this, but it's probably a, a good time. What are some strategies to grieve the loss of something? Mm, we could spend like two hours talking <laughs> about that. Um, so uh, a couple of strategies. Um, one, um, taking a, a moment and sitting down and talking about the things that were, right, the things you'll miss, the things that you're not going to get back. Because regardless, even if you look the same, things are still different because cancer forever changes that. It changes the way you view the world. It changes the way you view life and interaction. So writing down that list of things that you've lost. And then I would say um, cry, scream, yell, and then burn it. And take those ashes and put it in something that's gonna come up with life. So whether you put it in a pot that's already got flowers in it, that you watch life continue to grow, whether you plant it with seeds and let the seeds grow, whether you take it out to um, a garden and, and spread the ashes, but give it something new so you can grieve and let go and also know that there's something um, moving forward. Um, Counseling obviously helps with um, grief work and getting support and, and help. Spiritual, if you pray um, or meditate, certainly that can be very helpful as well. Um, time is the most healing with grief if you're allowing yourself to grieve. And I think to the point of I'm numb, I'm just getting through, holy cow, what just happened, that's when that wave often hits. And so taking it in bite-sized bite chunks as well um, is really important because it can get very overwhelming very fast. Um, and other things like journaling, writing music, playing music, there are lots of things that can also help with um, grief work. There are grief groups that are not just about death. Mm -hmm. um, and so there may be an online group or an online chat forum about loss um, that, again, isn't about death but about loss. And support groups can be really powerful, whether they're online or if you're more of a face-to-face -face person, finding a support group. I know in our young adult group, that comes up over and over and over again in different ways. So talking about it, letting yourself feel, writing it down, burning it, seeing the it was and it can be. And putting the and in things is really important. You've heard me say and a lot because there has to be both. There has to be room for both. It can't be absolutes. It can't be life before cancer, and I'm never going to have it again. It has to be life before cancer, and I'm going to have a great life after cancer. There has to be that and. I can be scared and be hopeful. I can grieve and be happy. Both can be true, and there's got to be room for that to be both to be true. Great. Thank you. So for those people that have hung in, Dana, can you let everybody know what their special gift is? And then we'll, we'll wrap up and thank everyone. Well, we want to thank everybody for uh, joining uh, and talking about body image and sexuality and intimacy. And Ana Ono is giving um, anybody that stay tuned a $25 gift certificate to us at anaono.com. So please, if you have any questions, LBBC will be sending out links for you to use um, at checkout. But if you have any questions about how to fit your uh, new foobs or no foobs, one breast, no breasts, we really, really have something for everybody. So so please feel free to reach out, call us, email me, whatever you need. We're here to help. We're always here to support so you never feel alone. Great. Well, that's a, that's a great gift. So it's worth staying involved. Um, so we're going to have to wrap up. I knew this hour would go really fast. And Sage, you've given a lot of great information. Just so everybody knows, Sage has done other programs for Living Beyond Breast Cancer, and they are 
on our website, both um, audio files as well as video files. So you can, she's done talks on intimacy and sexuality, lots of information. So stay in touch with us. But I want to give both of you the chance to maybe say a couple words, just any takeaways you want to say, like to inspire someone who is struggling um, or something that you, you kind of learned today that you want to share. Um, thank you. I did want to say that we are not our bodies, and you are so much more than cancer or any reconstruction or any of that, and you really have to get that in your mind. It's not easy, but you just have to know that your spirit is going to live on much longer than your body. Mm. That's great. That's great. Um, I would just say advocate for yourself. Talk to other people. Reach out to other people. Don't be scared to do that. Yes. That's great. Yeah. Do you want to... No, just thank you for your willingness to be here and be vulnerable. I think, you know, again, body image um, is such an intimate and um, personal topic. Sexuality and sex is, a, is can be a piece of it, but also separate. And so knowing and loving and reclaiming your body is a really important thing, whether you're in a relationship or not, whether you're in a sexual relationship or not. Um, and I would just challenge you to find ways to, to be kind, gracious, and loving to yourself every day um, in ways that work for you. That's great. I actually have on my computer like five sentences of what does gratitude look like, and also not just for myself, but also gratitude I want to extend to all the people in my life. Like, assume goodwill. <laughs> You know, assume people are trying their best, and it does really help reframe um, some of the, because it's, it's a hard world, you it know, is. it is. So I really want to thank you, all of you, for, for opening up and for sharing and for Sage to taking the time to get to Philadelphia and do the program. Mm -hmm. I want to thank our sponsors again, the CDC, as well as Chico's FAS. Um, I think all of you have evaluation forms, and the staff really likes to get them. We, we really listen to what our participants have to say it helps us improve our program. So when you get that form emailed to you, please fill it out. Go to AnnaOno.com and shop. And um, just stay in touch with Living Beyond Breast Cancer and join that closed Facebook page. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.